So I'm here to talk about career advice. Um, and as Chris previewed, I want to push back against some ideas that we have taken for granted and sort of assume are true. And I wanted to start with someone uh, who I think would be well appreciated by this crowd, and that's the late Steve Jobs. And in particular, I want to go back to the early summer of 2005. And this is when Steve Jobs took the podium at Stanford Stadium in front of a crowd of 23,000. And he was there to give the commencement address to Stanford's graduating class. This is a big deal. Jobs did not give a lot of these sort of touchy-feely speeches, but he showed up. He may have been wearing sandals under his robes, which he was, but he did show up and he gave his talk. And by all accounts, it was a really good one. It's clear that people interpreted him there as saying, guys, if you want to love what you do for a living, you have to do two things. You have to first figure out what you're passionate about, and then you have to second match that to your work. Now, we are used to this idea in sort of common slang. We summarize it with the phrase, follow your passion, right? And we say, follow your passion. This is what we're talking about. Figure out what you're passionate about, match it to your work. Things will be good. And I'm not surprised that it excited people, because if you think about this piece of advice, follow your passion, it is an astonishingly appealing concept. It tells you a life, a working life at least, that you love is not just possible, but it's very close. Right? You have to, what do you have to do? You have to do some introspection to figure out what you're passionate about. So you take a strengths finders, you pour wax in the water, and if it solidifies like a microscope, you should be a biologist, whatever you need to do. <laughs> a little bit of introspection doesn't take long. And then you have to go find a, a job that matches that. Now, you're going to have to read some blog posts that will inspire you first to get your courage up. But then you go and you, you get the job that matches it. <laughs> then you're passionate, right? I mean, you could be here in this audience today. You could be miserable about your, your life. And by playoff season, you could have a Steve Jobs-like love for what you do. And very appealing. But there is a wrinkle here, as Chris previewed. And the wrinkle is, as it turns out, this advice is not only astonishingly appealing, but it is also astonishingly wrong. And that's what I'm here today to talk about. So I spent much of the last year researching and writing a book that looked at a very simple question. Why do some people end up loving what they do while so many other people do not? So I'll start with the first story. And I think we should pick up where we left off. We heard Steve Jobs' advice later in his career. I'm interested in going back and asking the question of how his own career actually began. So if we rewind the clock back to a young Steve Jobs, who's, say, about to go to college and is trying to decide, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go to college? What am I going to study? You would have found a young man who was certainly interested in electronics. He had grown up in Silicon Valley's wirehead culture. This was a culture where young men and women would tinker with electronics much in the same way that the generation before would tinker with cars, right? That's what was happening around Silicon Valley at that point. So it was a hobby of his. It's something that he, he was interested in. But I'd make the argument that if you asked him, Steve, what are you passionate about? He wouldn't have said electronics. He wouldn't have said starting a technology company that's going to take over the world. And we know this because of his college choice. He didn't go to Berkeley to study electrical engineering, which is what you would have done in that time, in that place, if you were passionate about electronics. And he didn't go to Stanford or USC to study business, which is what you would have done in that time, in that place, if you were passionate about business or entrepreneurship. Instead, he came up here to a college not far from where we're sitting today, an elite liberal arts school known as Reed College. He went there. He was studying Western history. He was studying dance. And he started to dabble very seriously in Eastern mysticism, which had just made its way to the West Coast around this period. So he shows up to Reed College. He's studying these things. He's asking these big questions. He drops out pretty soon. He sticks around for a while. He wanders the campus barefoot. He's sort of like a campus celebrity. He eats weird diets. He's bumming meals from the local Hare Krishna temple. Eventually, he gets tired of being completely destitute. So he comes back to California, and he talks himself into a night shift job at Atari, whose sole one of the most important things about it was that it gave him a flexibility so he wouldn't be tied down. This is a period in which he went and spent several months on a mendicant's journey in India. He was beginning to spend more and more time at the All One Commune just upstate and became more serious about Zen meditation, frequenting the Los Altos Zen Center more and more. So this was Jobs during this period. So where did Apple Computer come from? Well, he and his friend Steve Wozniak, who he'd, he'd reconnected with, 
had started launching what I think is best described as a, a series of schemes where they would cobble something together, maybe sell it out of the back of a car, make a little bit of money, keep the wolf at bay, keep food on the table while you know, Jobs was seeking and searching and tackling these, these deep philosophical and spiritual questions. And for lack of a better word, Apple Computer came out of one of these schemes. They had been tinkering more was than Jobs on a circuit board for what would become the Apple One. They took it to the Homebrew Computing Club. The geeks got all excited about it. I say this lovingly, being a professional geek. They get all excited about it. Job says, you know, I think we can make a little bit of money off this. So he walks over to Paul Terrell's Byte Shop, which is this sort of pioneering electronics store over in Mountain View. The, the myth says he walked in barefoot, though we don't have evidence for that in the biographical record. But he walks to the store nonetheless. He brings in this circuit board, and he says, look, the geeks are excited about this. We want to sell you 100 of them. You sell them to the geeks. We'll all make some money. Jeffrey Young, one of his first sort of definitive biographers actually did through interviews the numbers they had worked out. And they said, after he sells those, we get our cut, the cost of manufacturing, we'll make, me and Waz will make about $1,000. And this biographer goes out of the way to emphasize that this was a small time idea. Their plans were circumspect and they certainly weren't thinking about taking over the world. Paul Terrell, fortunately, had more vision than Steve Jobs. And he said, I don't want to buy 100 circuit boards to sell to geeks. I want to buy 500 fully assembled computers with all the peripherals put in. I want to sell these like appliances, and I want to pay you 10 times the amount that you wanted for the circuit board. And Steve Jobs, to his credit, said, ah, I think this is something big that I'm onto. And they went and they raised a little bit of money. They built these. They raised some more serious money. They incorporated. Apple Computer was born out of that. So the point I want to draw from this story is that I don't doubt that Steve Jobs very quickly grew to be very passionate about what he did. But it's also the case that he did not simply follow his passion into Apple Computer. He did not sit down and plan out in advance, I want to start a technology company and then go and try to make that happen. If you had gone back in time, if we got in a time machine today, we went back and we said we're from the World Domination Summit, six months before Apple Computer was formed and say, Steve, you have to follow your passion, he would have ended up an instructor at the Los Altos Zen Center. Right? This was the things he was caring about. And I'm sure he would have been an insanely great instructor <laughs> and that the meditation mats would have been laid out in a sort of beautiful but functional <laughs> design. <laughs> but these were the type of things he would have said he was passionate about. So the lesson I wanted to draw from the story here is that the path to a passionate life is also or often way more complex than the simple advice follow your passion would suggest. The second lesson is that we don't really have any reason to believe that follow your passion is actually generally good advice. So I'm a scientist, so my first inclination when I took on this project was to study the scientific literature. And there is a lot of literature on workplace happiness and workplace motivation. And if you look in this literature, you would think that you would find lots of support for this idea because this is one of the most popular ideas in modern American career thinking. But you can't. <coughs> In fact, finding evidence that matching your job to a pre-existing passion is good is very hard to do. What you find instead is studies that point in the opposite direction. So one of my favorites is by a young researcher named Amy Rosinski. At the time, she was a graduate student at Michigan. She took a group of people, a group of employees, that all had the same position. They all worked in university administration just right at the same level. She interviewed them and she found out that a third of them saw this position as a calling. So a third of these people were passionate about this. It was an important part of their identity. It was an important part of their life, this position. The other two thirds of people did not. Some of them just saw it as work and, and the rest saw it as a stepping stone in a, in a larger career and they could take and leave what they were doing right then. So what I like about Rosinski is that she then said, I'm going to dive deeper. And I'm going to try to figure out what's different between these two people. What was different between the calling group and the non-calling group? And what she found was that one of the largest predictive factors of being in the calling group, if not the biggest predictive factor, was years of experience. The longer someone had this position, the more likely they were to see it as their calling. Which, of course, is a way more complicated story than follow your passion tells us, which is, no, 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 you've matched this job to what you were meant to do. You'll therefore immediately love it. And Rosinski is saying, that's not what I found. 
there's something more complicated happening here. Another study I like is by a, a Canadian psychologist named Robert Valorand, who had developed this survey that allows you to figure out what, if anything, is a person actually passionate about. Not interested, but actually passionate about. He has to survey, and he takes it and he administers it to 539 Canadian university students. Okay. He found less than 4% of these students had a passion that you could realistically connect to a career. Less than 4%. Do you want to guess what the number one passion was from among these Canadian university students? Hockey. It was a good crowd. It was exactly hockey. That's right. <laughs> and he was born in 1940. So you guys are good. <laughs> That's right. It was hockey. I mean, look, it's possible that this university had one of the most astonishing concentration of hockey talent to ever be assembled under one roof, and that they should all follow their passion and field nine different NHL teams. But it's more likely that for 96% of these students to tell them, figure out what you're passionate about and go do that, would have failed for them as career advice in figuring out what to do right after school. So that's the second lesson I wanted to draw here. When you look to the literature, we don't have much evidence that this is generally a good piece of career advice. So Bill McKibben's story we can pick up as an undergraduate at Harvard University. So the thing about Harvard um, is that it's an it's a extracurricular shop, right? I mean, the, the grade inflation at Harvard is so high that you can get you know, an A minus for spelling like nine out of 10 letters in your name correct on the test, right? So you have all of these type A's who are here. They're all very achievement oriented. So they put all this energy into extracurriculars and they bring on these extracurricular loads that make our full-time job seem like we're idle. So McKibben shows up, he's like, well, what am I going to do? And he decides he's going to write for the Harvard Crimson, this sort of fabled student newspaper. So he goes, and it's hard, you know, it's really demanding. Uh, but he works hard, and he works his way up, he stretches himself, he gets better at writing. By the time he graduates, he's an editor at the Crimson, which is a big deal. And then he gets a job at the New Yorker because he's been an editor at the Crimson. And now he has much better editors, and he's surrounded by some of the, the best writers in American letters. And again, he's being stretched. He's not writing 10,000 word profiles, he's writing the talk of the town, but he's stretching and he's working hard and he's getting better and he starts to make a name for himself there and he starts to move up. But what I like about his story is the twist that comes next. So McKibben quits the New Yorker just as he's starting to establish himself as one of their star new writers and he moves to a cabin in Vermont to write a book on man's impact on ecosystems and the environment. Which, you know, 2012 in Portland is sort of old news, but back then people didn't quite understand the scope of this. So he goes to Vermont with a book deal and a big enough advance to live there for, you know, however long it took to write this book. And he came away with The End of Nature was the book he wrote. And this was a big bestseller, but more importantly, it was a, an important, important book in the environmental movement and established him as, a, as an important thinker and writer in this space. And it allowed him to go on and have a career living in a cabin, living in Vermont, but writing these sort of very cool issue books around environmental issues and other types of issues. He would come up with the ideas that were interesting. He would go around and, and, and research and write them, and they would all be very successful, and, and he was having a real impact on the world, too. And I've only met him in passing, but I've read a lot of the interviews people have done with him, and I think it's fair to say that he's very passionate about what he does, and he loves his life. So the question is, what lessons can we draw from him? What did he do if it was not just follow his passion? Well, the first lesson I would draw from McKibben's story is that he got good at something that was rare and valuable. In his case, it was writing. He got good, very good, at writing. It took him about a decade, right? He had to come up through the, the Crimson and then into the New Yorker, but he got very good at writing. And this pattern is common when you study people like him who love what they do. They tend to start by getting good at something rare and valuable, something that the outside world says, this is valuable, you are valuable now to our economy, to our field. The second lesson to draw here is that once he got good at something rare and valuable, he used it as leverage to gain into his life the type of traits that matter to him. So again, I'm extrapolating off of interviews, but given my somewhat obsessive stock in a Bill McKibben, I can say that the three things that I think matter to him probably are simplicity in his life, autonomy in his life, 
and an impact on the world. Different people would have different answers to these questions, but that was probably was what was important to McKibben. Third lesson I want to offer, and this is often the most controversial when I talk about these issues. What you do for your work is much less important than we think. All right, this is like a corollary of everything we've said so far. Bill McKibben built the life he loved as a writer. I would maintain that there are any number of other paths he could have followed that would have led him to a life that he loved just as much. I argue what mattered for him was the fact that he had autonomy, that he had simplicity, that he had impact in his life, that he had these general traits that were important to him in his life. So he got those by being a writer, but what was more important is that he got good at something valuable and used it as leverage to get the traits. And any position, any field of pursuit in which he could have got leverage and got those traits in his life, I would maintain that he would be just as happy and he would love his life just as well. And this was certainly the sense I got with the people I interviewed who loved their life. I got this sense that, look, it was these general traits they had. They're different for different people, right? I mean, different people want different things. You know, some people want to be at the center of everything. Some people want to live in a cabin. Some people want impact. Some people just want, they want creativity more than anything else, right? These differs for different people. But the sense I got studying these great examples was that it wasn't the specific work that mattered. It was these traits. And the get good and then exchange that value for these traits was the most consistent formula for getting those, the most consistent formula for loving what you do. Because again, it's not the specific work that leads people to love it. It's not the fact that you're using the microscope or that, that you're actually writing that makes you love that work. It's these general traits. And if it's interesting to you, that means you're going to be able to stick with it and get good. And if it gives options to people when they get good, that means you're going to be able to leverage that ability once you have it. And that's what you need. But to summarize what I'm saying here, right? For the last, since the mid-1980s, that's 20 years or so, we've been dominated by this idea that if you want to be happy, you have to figure out in advance what you're passionate about, and then you have to match it to your work. I will summarize it for you to bring it back to where we started by saying, I guess the easiest you know, summary here is do what Steve Jobs did, not what he said.